Hello and welcome to the first ever The Art of Conversation. This guy, he's been cool for 50 plus years. Pat Riley, basketball god. He and I began as adversaries. I'm a media guy. He's a basketball legend. We're something different now. Let's show you some of his life. cars that you fantasized about when you were like the James to Dean dream? car was the one that I fantasized about. That's the car that I have in California. Rebel Without a Cause was one of my favorite movies. When I saw the car, that car in that movie, I always dreamt that one day I'd love to have that Mercury. And 50 years later, I ended up buying the car from Billy Gibbons from ZZ Top. Fighting across 50 basketball years, Pat Riley has been a poet, a philosopher, a teacher, an orchestra leader, a champion, and an icon. It's back-to-back -back titles for the Heat. As a player, Riley never averaged more than 22 minutes or 11 points a game. His NBA career ending in depression. As a coach, he harnessed that failure and fear as fuel and worked the Lakers to seven finals in his first eight years. Be quick, be quick, be quick. Winning four championships by age 43. Riley is an Irish romantic whose Armani packaging has always obscured that he is more mechanic than model. Now Riley grabs Harper and is yelling at him. Grime and grit smears found on his every greatness. What is it about the greed of winning that it's insatiable? I hated to lose. I always thought there would be severe consequences for me if I lost. It was personal from that standpoint. But how could you feel that way? Why, why I just you... did. It's just the way it is. You can't... I felt that way because that's the way it was in my, in my life, you know, from the first day that I came out of my mother's womb to the first time that I played competitive basketball. I just felt that I'm not going to let anybody take anything from me that I've worked hard enough to get. I think it, at times I tried to conjure up inside of me an emotion that was unhappy because and made me miserable because that's what I took to my players every day. We're indifferent to everything. Get up. We're indifferent to picks. We're indifferent to one another. We're holding on the ball. We're just not playing the game. Winning, uh, to me, at all costs means you will do anything within the rules to get the win. You have to convince your players that this is what it takes and this is the cost and the cost is that you better get your ass in the best shape that you ever got in your life and the only way you can do that is you gotta work that's winning at all costs that's but you're takes. unreasonable about it you're 73 years old and you've said no. before you live in an no, adversarial but I tell you world what they did that they brought it out of me when you compete against the birds or you compete against the michael jordans they bring out the best in you now as great as they were as players they knew that if they played against our teams that we're coming after him. We're coming after him home. It's a lot of hard feelings here. And Pat Riley here he is right now. Do you have a favorite championship? If I force you to pick one championship. 85. And in 84, we lost the Celtics in a seven game series in which it was my fault. They blame Magic, and Magic got trashed because he missed a few free throws. Magic Johnson misses an important free throw. Pat Riley knows it. And all of a sudden, they called him, you know, Tragic Magic, and he was a choker and all of that stuff. So we were the L.A. Fakers. Uh, we had that series won. And I really did a horrible job. What did you screw up? When you say that it's I my called fault. a timeout, OK? So the Lakers do not have to take a shot. And all of a sudden, it's dead quiet in Boston Garden. We had the game won. We were ahead by two. I knew that they were going to trap Magic. So James Worthy was the guy that came to the ball. So they came off of Magic, trapped James. If he had thrown it right back to Magic, it would have been fine. But he went cross court with it. Gerald Henderson steals it. They beat us in overtime. The Boston Celtics are the NBA world champion. So 85, when we came back, I knew that I was at the end of my contract. Uh, we just got beaten twice in a row in the finals. I really felt we had to win that year against a team that we hated. In 85, when we went and beat them, and I remember Kareem after that horrible Memorial Day massacre game, got beat 148 to 114, and then Cap got killed by everybody. Game had passed him by. Mm -hmm. 
And on Thursday night, Cap came out and got like 37 points and 17 rebounds, and we ended up beating them in game two. And the old man has looked like a young man tonight. And then we ended up beating them in six games. We came back to the parquet floor and beat them on their court. However, we did not treat them like they treated us. We, we treated them with class. LA comes to Boston and wins the world title. A troublemaker in search of discipline, Riley fled his bleak upbringing for Kentucky, where his all-white team famously lost to Texas Western's all-black one. A first-round pick, he played a decade in the NBA and won the 1972 championship next to the league's logo, Jerry West. Basketball success became the new way to feel love. Your parents didn't attend many of your games when you were having success yeah. in college and the pros. Did they attend any of those games? No, they never, they never came. Is there one game that you wish that they had been at because it probably would have felt good to share it? Any game, but you know, my dad passed away when I was 25 years old. So anything that I did after 25, that was great. You know, he wasn't gonna see anyhow. I don't look at that and have any negative feelings about him not being there. You know, I mean, I wish I could have seen my father before he died. But I, but I, I could. My whole life, I, I wanted to have a, a hot rod. We call her Marilyn. I was very fortunate enough to get this car and then turn it over to Dave to, to put everything together so it would be drivable and safe. And this is another one, it's called the Bad Apple. But my, my mouth is watering and drooling as we get to the point where we're gonna make this drivable. What a show off, what a show now, off. I could not drive this car legally, probably get a ticket. I like the idea of you getting pulled over. There ain't anybody in Miami who's gonna give you a ticket. What can you tell us about the time in your life when you owned a single pair of pants? You know, thank God we had brothers and all, everything was hand-me-down. And, and so I went to St. Joseph's Academy and our uniform was khakis and you know white shirt or something like that. But I had one pair of khakis and uh, I used to have to wash them myself, and there were no dryers back then. I didn't have time to hang it out, you know, on a clothesline with some clothespins and stuff, and so I put them in the oven, and they were in an oven to dry, but I left them on. <laughs> oh, you left them on <laughs> I too left long. them in there too long. Oh, I no. took them on, there's a grill marks oh, no. on my back, on my butt, and you know, on the back of my legs, and so, them. and that was it. And there was nothing I could do about it, is all I had, so I went to school in my, my grill. Your baked, <laughs> my baked pants. Your baked pair of pants. And, uh, and of course, all my friends noticed it and wanted hamburgers or they wanted, what'd you do or whatever it was. But and, did uh, that do anything to shape the GQ coach who later no, in life would be selling like Armani in this country? Yeah, like, may, maybe it did. How did, uh, you know, not having very much, how did that toughen you up? I never felt like, you know, I didn't have enough or they didn't do enough for me. I never felt that. I felt that. That was who it was, and that's how it was, and I was okay with it. You know, if one of my friends ever said something about it, hell bent for leather, coming their way. I don't think people understand that you're more of a street fighter than you are sort of the fashion model runway coach. I had to get motivated to get into, into street fights. I love to go into pool rooms and shoot pool and uh, hang out at the tracks and stuff like that. I hung with some guys that wouldn't take anything from anybody and like it is in any community, there's four or five different areas that have, you know, different guys compete for certain territories. But I never went looking for it, but things happen. And when they happen, you had to go into action. <laughs> from baked pants to GQ, the street fighter from upstate New York turned sidelines into a fashion runway. But he exchanged that Showtime blitz for a New York motorcycle gang. He reached game seven of the finals with the Knicks. Max for three. Now that tells the story. But his exit, like his team, was tough and graceless. There will not be a fifth championship for Pat Riley. 
The Knicks was a fiasco, okay? It's my fault. I regret, you know, tortiously interfering to get myself out of a contract and getting out of New York for whatever the reasons were. But from the time I left the Knicks to the time I went back for the first game, it was probably one of the worst times of my life publicly as far as getting criticized and being called names and being called out. And, and probably I deserved all of that. The reaction to Pat Riley's first return to the Garden was anything but warm and fuzzy. I resigned two weeks before the facts, and the only reason why the facts has become fashionable is because I was ordered to send the facts by the commissioner. Otherwise, I wouldn't have sent a damn facts, okay? And then the death threats came, and then, you know, all the other ugliness came, and so we finally went back uh, to play the game. Uh, by that time, our, our team was hurt. Everybody was hurt. You Joe, didn't was anybody. You didn't Joe was anybody. out. Joe was out. Kevin was you out. Went into New Billy York. Owens you was went out. Into the New York naked. We went naked. into New York and we were having a bad time. And uh, I heard this incredible resounding boo. I was going to make a left and go right to the bench and just sit down meekly. That would have been okay. But instead, I walked to center court. I don't know what made me do it. But I also. I clapped to them. I tried to clap to them, too, that, that I appreciated the fans, and they were very respectful to me. But we got out to the 12-2 the two lead. I thought we were going to win that game, then we got hammered. <laughs> Late in life, you have chosen joy away from coaching. You've chosen these moments of joy that you're going to great extent to plan. Even when I wasn't coaching, when I had summers off, I was thinking the game. It was really very, very selfish on my part, but I just closed everything else out, and that's what, that's what I did. And so now, you know, I mean, the things that, that, that we do and, and plan to do are fun. Your wife has been by your side through some very difficult stuff. Can you tell people what recently you've done with her to renew your vows? Because I don't think people have seen or heard from the romantic Pat Riley uh, very often. Know, I mean, you got to stop this romance stuff. I wanted to let her know I was going to have a birthday party for her. And so we did one in Miami, one in LA, and we did a party in Hawaii. She didn't realize that, you know, at, at the end of this whole thing is that I was going to surprise her by renewing our vows. We all went from a fake picture and everybody just sort of left Chris and I and she's going like, where did everybody go? <laughs> wow. And then one of her best friends came out and put the veil on and she says, what's, what's going on? And uh, I like to get her. I, Pat, once again take Chris to be my best friend. I look forward to waking you with a smile and holding you when you cry. I take this crazy, passionate, eccentric man to be my husband again. Can I kiss the bride? Oh, yes! Oh, <laughs> she was there when you were a beach bum, when you were in a van with flames on the side and there was a mattress in the back during... Not a mattress. A, a, Not a no, mattress. No, it was I thought... an actually... It was, a, it was a salt and pepper, chocolate brown carpet on a bench, okay? <laughs> there wasn't fair, a mattress. Fair enough, but she was there during, that was the hardest time, right? When you, had, when you, had, you were done with your playing career, yeah. and now you're, you're a beach bum. For... We are. What we were doing back then when I retired is I went through a period of tremendous depression when I got, you know, I was no, no, no longer part of the league. I was not a professional basketball player anymore. She got me through this real dark time after my career was over with. So once I got back inside of the NBA doing anything, I took whatever came next, and things happened for me in a miraculous way. How she got drawn into it, when I became the head coach of the Lakers, she knew the responsibility of what it was going to be to be a head coach. But this was a Mr. and Mrs. job. This was a head coach and a wife who were totally committed to the team and to the players, and uh, me coaching the players, she trying to help as much as she can with the wives. We became Mr. and Mrs. Coach for, you know, 30 years. Pat Riley has been fighting all his life. For the old warrior still won't speak much to Larry Bird or Michael Jordan because of those coaching playoff scars they left decades ago. He still talks with bared teeth at 70 bleeping three about his love of winning at all costs, even while crying about when that cost was his family. 
Chris and I with our kids and traveling and summer vacations and all of this stuff, but it was all scheduled into little slot times. There were scheduled days to be happy. Yeah, there were and <laughs> you know, I couldn't, I couldn't pull that off very well, you know. Can you tell the story running on your daughter's wedding day because you were planning, you were very meticulous about planning all of the details. I didn't plan all these stuff. You, you were meticulous <laughs> about being present. You know, I got very nervous about things, so I was all of a sudden, I became somebody who started to take over and to go down and, you know, move things around. I was sweating, put on my tuxedo, and then I went and picked up my daughter. And while I was in the room, you know, in my tux and everything, somebody said, turn around and look out the window. The next thing, I felt a little, you know, on my uh, shoulder. I remember how emotional that day made It's a good life. moment. So, so I turned around and there she was. And what was giving her away like? Oh, giving her away was easy. That moment was hard. When would you point, looking back at your career introspectively, and say, that's where I was most guilty of too much ego? I thought I was the reason why the, why the Lakers were successful. That's you know, funny. I mean, we, <laughs> That's you know, funny in retrospect. But I also felt that I did a good job. And I've had some players, even when I coached here with the Heat, thought that I got too far out there. But it wasn't because I was trying to get celebrity. It's just because of how I was dealing with them and what I wanted and the demands that I put on them. I remember some stories about Alonzo Mourning and you getting face to face, yelling at each other. You thrived in that conflict. You know, if you want to say F you Let to it me, go. Let it go. but you better teach me something about why you're saying it. But in the end, that's all part of the game. Conflict, celebration, joy, monotony, all those things, they go into one basket where one day you can get together, put your arms around one another and cry. And you can cry like babies because you're just so joyous about winning the championship. I mean, that's the other side of it too. You've told me the story of being crushed at your desk, crying after the Knicks uh, took apart the heat. And the New York Knicks have become the second team in NBA history to knock off a number one. It's your former team, Alonzo Mourning comes into your office, you're crying and he tells you go do your job. Is that the most crushing defeat Whatever. you've suffered? I almost quit that summer. You were broken? I was broken. I walked into my office, put my head between my hands, and just started bawling. You know, I mean, it was it. You know, I just couldn't get over it. And then the, the, the light that comes to you in this game, you know. <laughs> so I look up. And I see, you know, 6'10", 270 pounds, you know, pure granite. <laughs> and he's looking at me. And he says, uh, I know you're feeling a little bit low, coach, but you got to get up and get back into that locker room and do your job and finish the season up. And I looked at him like, He's right, you know, so I mean, he, 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 when I looked up at Zoe, it was like, you know, this light was coming into me, do your goddamn job, finish this season off, even though you don't want to talk to him. I couldn't face my players. You know, I, I felt that I'd let him down again, so. So I went in and finished it off, you know. So you have those moments, I think, with, with, with players when uh, they can inspire you to really inspire other people. When you get emotional thinking about that, is it because of pain or is it because you love Alonzo Mourning and what he, the way he worked? No, and what... it's, it's the affection that I have for Zoe. But when somebody gives you everything that they have because you've requested it. But he did everything you asked and then it wasn't enough. Yeah, but it was enough in 2006. Ah, there you go. There you went. You got him the finally, championship. Yeah, there finally we can let go. So we can let go be able to bring him back and to win that championship and have him in the second half, you know, be the difference in that game. I never forget those things. You can never, ever, ever, ever say again to anybody in here that you're not a champion.
Bobby Bowden said there was only one major event after retirement, so he wasn't in any kind of hurry <laughs> to retire. You're a worker, right? I don't believe in, in retirement. I believe in what's next. You gotta look forward to doing something other than laying on your ass. At my age of 73, you gotta have something to chase. I'm still chasing another championship with Eric and with Mickey and with the team. And how we're gonna get there, I don't know, but we're gonna get there again one day, and I believe that. Do you have a fear of extinction? I think I've been around long enough after 51 years of being in the game. I've had a great trip, and I've gone wire to wire because I have been so lucky and so blessed to have, you know, great players and people in my life that help me and support me. Riley has softened some, but he's gotten more gentle only in the ways a mafia godfather might. That's the tax on nine championships as a player, coach, and executive and the tax on being talented enough to win Coach of the Year in three cities with three different styles. You win, but friendships, family time, and even love can get lost. Such was Riley's maniacal focus and greed, always distilling his globe to the size of that basketball. It's a little bit ostentatious. It is, it is. <laughs> but it's also, it that's is. a great ride. Can this just run the entire time? Oh, is this, no. it, does this get no, in the way of your have sound? That, and then when I see sweat, I can do this to him. That'll make it even more fun. Is that good? Yeah. It's a committed to goop, goop, a goopless interview. This Middle might tip. actually be the whiskey. You the know whiskey? The whiskey? It might be because whiskey has gluten. When were you driven by insecurity? Right what? now. Right now? Yeah. Right I'm now. driven by insecurity being around you. Oh, I thought you were saying this time in your life. He's speeding it up. I'm sorry. We'll do the rest of this in a bit. 